Hello there and welcome to another episode of Inside Out Alignment. Your host, Mary Tapper. It's a pleasure to be here and your platform for self-discovery and creativity. Today, we are so blessed to have with us Oliver Reed, who is a sales coach and trainer. He has a lot to share with us today, so stay tuned and enjoy this time together. Oliver, thank you so much for accepting to be here with us today. Thank you for the opportunity. We are honored and it's a pleasure to have you. Welcome. Thank you for having me, Mary. Beautiful. So, Oliver, uh, for the short time that I've known you, you talk a lot about sales. I would like you to introduce us into that sales environment. What is sales to you? Okay, um, sales to me is a process. And it's a process of where I may have a solution to a particular pain or problem that someone's suffering with, and I will help them resolve that particular pain or solution, particular pain that they're struggling with. So for me, that's sales. And it's also about communication as well. So it's not just necessarily getting the sale through. It's also about, like I said, one of the key things is communication. How can I help them to, to better themselves? And sales at the same time is not about arm barring or forcing people into a corner in order to, to purchase something from, from me. So in a nutshell, that's what sales is of to me. That's in a nutshell. Beautiful. So getting into sales, how did you get to start, you know, get interested or really uh, hone yourself into this and it has become a part of you? That's a very good question. Um, initially when I started, I was a techie. I was a geek. I used to like breaking computers and fixing them and coding. One of my first jobs out of school, I was providing uh, PC support to various clients. However, I also liked to talk. I liked to talk a lot. And I remember going to a Christmas party and I sat down at the table with all the other geeks and all the other techies. And everyone brought out their PDAs, their, their smartphones, their digital cameras. And all they could do was just talk of technology. Yeah, I can talk of technology, but I want to get up and mingle with everyone else there from the company and, and potential clients. Eventually, I decided that even though I like technology and I liked the hardware and tech stuff, that I thought I'd give, I thought I'd give sales a go. So I moved on to working in the city for, for um, various IT vendors. And I remember, I remember going in for an interview that was only supposed to be one hour long, but the interview ended up being three hours long. And during the interview, I was taken out to lunch. I got to meet the CFO of the firm. And they, the MD at the time, he really liked me. We didn't even talk of business. We didn't talk of work. It was more of, tell me about your background. What do your parents do? What do you like doing? What do you not like doing? And the MD and I, we just clicked because he wasn't a techie. He was a salesperson. I wasn't necessarily a salesperson at the time. I was a techie. And on my first day, well, prior to my first day starting, I was told what my title was, which was business development manager. And that sounded so good, Mary. Mary, you're, you're young. You're told you're a manager. You're like, wow. On my first day when I started, I remember I walked into the office. There was a desk with a laptop and a phone. And that was it. But in my head, I just wanted to go out and meet clients and sell to them. I didn't know that in order for me to do that, I'd have to find them first and arrange the meetings, then go out and meet them. So... That's my, uh, I'm going to say, official route into sales from being a tech straight into that cold calling. So when you actually, when you started, because this wasn't something that you were used to doing, but you were interested in and you came to be in that place where you were starting. So how was your journey navigating and, you know, understanding all this and knowing how to you know, put the puzzles to get to your end goal. Oh, you're so right. It, 
it wasn't what I expected at all. I thought sales was going out, having lunch, having dinner, drinking and winning business. I was not expecting to cold call, which is part of the process. You can't sell to a client if you don't have a client. And the only way you're going to get clients is to pick up the phone, make those calls and arrange the face to face. When I started, I wasn't expecting the amount of verbal abuse. I would have people screaming at me down the phone, shouting at me, threatening me. And it was an experience. But in that line, in this line of business, it, it's water under the bridge. It's water on a duck's back. You cannot take it personally. And you live and you learn. And at the time, I was blessed to be surrounded by so many various experienced sales professionals that could get those appointments. Once you've got an appointment, you can then go out, meet the client and potentially sell to them. So that was a stepping stone. The working in the city, representing various vendors, that was a stepping stone. And the reason why I say that was because it was pure sales 101. And we did not adapt the 1980s salesman approach. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Is, is, is that something you've heard of before, Mary? The 1980s salesman approach. What is that approach? If you can explain that to us a little bit. The 1980s salesman's approach is you lie through your teeth to get to the person that you need to speak to. <laughs> yes, you literally lie and you are encouraged to lie to get through to the decision maker. So, for example... I may call into a large bank and I will ask to be put through to the CEO and say that I was playing golf with him over the weekend and I want, I want him to return my golf clubs. Can you put me through to him? That's an example. That's a 1980s salesman's approach. It's lying through your teeth to get to who you want to speak to uh, by any means necessary. So, when I started off in sales, we didn't have any of that at all, even mm -hmm. though I'd heard of it and I'd seen it. A lot of it was, Oliver, watch the people around you. Everyone's got their own style, their own technique. And it was great. And the reason why it was great was that it got me used to picking up the phone. I got used to, dare I say, being rejected and tweaking what I was having to say. From there... I then moved into consultative sales, which was a massive step up. So I'm not just necessarily picking up the phone and cold calling and making, say, up to 80 to 100 calls a day. I'm having conversations with people. Wow. I'm asking questions. I'm not talking anymore. I talk a little bit, but I get the person that I'm talking to to speak and tell me what they're struggling with. And once they tell me what they're struggling with, it's great. Let's book a time. And moving forward, and how has that helped me? It's improved my ability to communicate. Definitely my ability to ask questions. To also be patient. And a key thing when it comes to sales, Mary, is, again, the ability to listen, which, which is key and crucial to sales especially if you're offering a solution that's worth tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of dollars, mm -hmm. uh, that it's a, diff it's a different type of conversation and sales process altogether. And the, these experiences have helped me start numerous businesses, grow various businesses, start, start an exports company from China, all of these things. So they, they've helped me along the way. And now I just would like to give back uh, some of the knowledge and things that I've learned over the years, which will, in theory, allow people to achieve what they want mm -hmm. without the necessary heartache, if I can put it that way, and stress. Yeah, all that you went through. So yes. having all these, <laughs> all these, because I know like there are many people when they talk about sales, including myself. It's hard to pick up that phone and call. It's like you're already thinking about what they're going to say. It's like we are we already visualizing that negative, you know, talk from somebody on the other end. How were you able to get to that point where you're just picking the phone and get used to, you know, 
whatever answer is given, you're okay with it and just keep calling, you know, to get to that person? That's a very good question. And when I first started in sales, I'm going to say that mindset that you've just mentioned was very similar to what I had, except I needed to take the abuse. However, say for example, now, when I pick up the phone and I'm calling into an organization, there's a purpose. And I'm going to say, the purpose isn't necessarily for me to sell. It's for me to help them. And when I get through to whoever I need to speak to, again, I'm not selling. And Mm -hmm. because I'm not selling, because I'm not selling, they are willing to listen. All I want is a conversation. And I I want a conversation with them because I believe I can help them with whatever it is they might be struggling with. And chances are, if they are struggling with a particular pain and they don't know what the solution is, chances are there's a very high probability They will want to listen to what I have to say. So when it comes to the fear of rejection or thinking about what are they going to say, I'm not there to sell to them. People don't necessarily like being sold to. And if you go in with that mindset of sell, 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 yeah, you can. But chances are there might be a lot of rejection and abuse because you're not there to help them. You're there to make a quick buck if that makes sense. It definitely makes sense. In the way you put at it, it's like your intention going out there is not like you're going to sell. You've set an intention and that intention is that you're going to serve. And having that yes. in mind, it, you know, it takes you on another level and it gives, you just talked about something also very important, listening, which is key. So you're giving them the chance to actually just express themselves and telling them you your, their pain. And you have yes. your strategies and the type of questions that you ask in order to extract that from them. Which is the beauty, yes. it's like you have a strategy to go around it, to get, you know, to get to that point where you're able to actually serve them, to reach that goal. Yeah, I yeah. love that, I love that. I really do. Thanks for sharing that with us. Yeah. If Mary, if I was to say there's a secret to Mm -hmm. say, for example, cold calling, I'm going to say whenever you pick up the phone to cold call, never have the intent to sell. The goal is to sell, but don't have the intent to sell, have the intention to help and serve people. And Mm -hmm. in order to make this easy and for people, for the listeners and viewers, if you're walking down the high street or you're walking through a shopping mall and someone's holding a collection box or a clipboard, you think nothing of them. But as soon as you make that eye to eye contact and they smile at you, you know that they're going to want your money. And what do people generally do if you're walking through a shopping mall or down a high street and someone smiles at you holding a collection box, chances are you're gonna turn around and walk the other way because you know they're going to ask you for money. Cold calling is the same. Mm -hmm. So when you cold call into an organization, do not have that intent to sell. You're there to have a conversation. Can you help them with something? I love that and beautifully put as well. Thank you so much for that analogy. It helps, it like really clarifies everything. Thanks for that. So you said you had a turning point in your life when you moved to Hong Kong. What was that like and what like really motivated you to move to Hong Kong? So I moved to Hong Kong during the the financial crisis back in 2000 and between 2008 to 2010, when everyone was being made redundant, no one was hiring. uh, And it, it was just ridiculous. And I was in the UK, my girlfriend at the time, she was in Hong Kong working. She seemed very stable and secure. It, it was as if the Asian economy or the Hong Kong economy wasn't touched by what was happening with the rest of the world. And part of my goal was to move to Hong Kong anyway. So I was working for an information security consultancy firm. And the goal was to move to Hong Kong six months later and get married. 
And whilst I'd been made redundant and no one was hiring and I was going to numerous interviews, I then just, we, we just sped up the process. It's like, hurry up, Oliver, just come to Hong Kong and marry me. So then I just jumped on a plane. I didn't look back and I just flew out <laughs> to Hong Kong. <laughs> um, and I had to, I needed an open mind. And the reason why I say that is because when you're visiting a country as a tourist, you see what tourists see. When you move to another country, that's a different story and Hong Kong was no exception. So that was a massive turning point because I, I left everything behind. I moved out to a, a strange country stroke city where I didn't necessarily speak the language. I wasn't working, I was spending. And my first apartment was a studio. <clears throat> now to put things into perspective, was a studio that was smaller than my lounge back in the UK. And when it comes to property, Hong Kong's not necessarily cheap. Uh, so I had a studio that had enough space for a bed and a fridge plus a shower and a toilet. That was it. So it was a massive uh, kick up the bum, if I can put it that way. Get your stuff together. You're mm -hmm. in a strange land. You don't speak the language. You haven't got work. You're spending. So that was a, a massive turning point for myself. So how did you navigate your way through that time? I know you had a support, obviously, with your friend or your fiance. Yes. Right. So how I navigated. So I'm from an information security background and IT vendors. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't find work in Hong Kong at the time. No one understood information security. Everyone thinks of IT security, firewalls, antivirus. That's what everyone thinks of. I'm saying no, it's more. I couldn't find work and I jumped into a trap of which I was able to jump out of. And the trap in Hong Kong is that if you are a native speaker, an English speaker, it is to teach English. Mm. And I ended up teaching English for a good number of years. And like I said, it's a trap because you can easily, you can hit the ceiling very easily. And as after we got married and the family grew, I needed to put more food on the table and teaching English would not necessarily do that for you. And the only way to do that was to move out into a sales related road. So yeah, I started with the teaching English. Then I moved into recruitment, started a exporting company, grew a few firms. I did quite a few things out in Hong Kong, Mary. Did you learn the language? <laughs> yes. <laughs> I did. Um, I, I did. And I learned it from two places. One, when I was teaching English, I learned a lot of slang. Mm -hmm. At the same time, I also went to, to and had lessons. So every week I was having a three hour lesson in Cantonese. And a lot of people say you don't need to speak Chinese. Everyone can speak English. That's a lie. No. <laughs> in Hong Kong, not everyone speaks English. Wow. Oh, don't, learn, don't learn Cantonese. Learn Mandarin. Everyone speaks Mandarin. That's a lie. In Hong Kong, it's Cantonese. Even the Mandarin speakers speak Cantonese. And when we moved out and we had a decent size apartment, I remember going to Pizza Hut with, with my boy at the time. And I went in just speaking English. I did not want to speak Chinese. And I went in and said, hi, my name's Oliver. I ordered some food. And the people behind the counter, they picked the menu up and they pushed it towards <laughs> me and said, pizza. I said, yeah, yeah, I know it's pizza. I've already ordered. See, which pizza you like? Then I had to speak. Oh, they said, gong, 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 wa. I was like, yep, I speak Cantonese. Oh. And, <laughs> and I didn't want to, but I had to. And it put a smile on my face. And everyone around me was, was watching, thinking, oh, this, this Westerner can speak Cantonese. Right. So yeah, I did learn enough of it. It helped when it, it also helped when it came to work and securing new business. 
because mm-hmm. I wasn't necessarily the token white guy. I, I was a guy that can actually speak their language as well. So that definitely helped. And I'm sure they were relieved when you actually spoke the language. It's kind of like, oh, yes. you know, helps the, com- the conversation flow a little bit, you know. It's not yes. like somebody's trying to find out what you're saying. Yeah. Yeah. It's great. Definitely. So you say your, your secret, uh, you, 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 what to get, you know, like focus on the things that you, you do. You stick to, to a schedule. Oftentimes we are, we might start something but it's always like really difficult to stick on a schedule. What's your secret? Right, so I'm gonna talk of the schedule first and I'll talk of the distractions afterwards. Sure. Mm-hmm. Um, when I decided to go out alone and develop my own business and grow it and develop the brand and I'm, I'm very much a hands-on person. I like to know how things work before I outsource any of it. That way no one can pull the wool over my eyes. And when I started, when when you start your own business, there are so many things to do from the website development to graphics, to advertising, to social media, to putting together lists, to so there are so many things involved. And when I started, I even developing products, even developing products. So when I started in order to make use of my day, I thought, okay, I'm going to spend an an hour in the morning checking my emails and having breakfast. Then in the afternoon, there'll be two hours for training. Then there'll be one hour for reading. And then I'm going to spend a couple of hours putting together lists. Then I'm going to spend another couple of hours putting together a product. And I would do this from Monday to Friday, sometimes including Saturdays and Sundays. And I would, I would stick to it religiously. Even if I was tired or sick, I would stick to it religiously. Even say, for example, when it comes to ironing clothes, if, if, if I spend, if I allot one hour to iron my clothes and an hour is there, I stop ironing my clothes. That's it. I move on to the next task. Because if I don't do that, then I, I won't accomplish what I set out for during the day. Now, when it comes to distractions, I'm going to say you've really got to ask yourself, what are you doing and why are you doing it? Because the distractions will always be there. Our time on this earth is not unlimited. Mm -hmm. We've only got so many years. Make the most of it. Um, So schedule, I would say, is a definite. And just removing the distractions if, if there are distractions, get up and go for a walk. Don't, don't look at social media. Don't check your WhatsApp. Don't, in my opinion, those should in theory just be off. And you just stick to the schedule for your lunch, your breakfast, the time you sleep, time for training, time back, all of these things. Now, it might sound like I've got OC, obsessive compulsive behavior disorder, but it is something that works. And there are quite a few people I've spoken to who have paid X amount of monies to learn that they should put together a schedule. (laughs) And in my head, no, what time do you go to sleep? What time do you wake up? What time do you have breakfast? What time do you do A, B, and C? Set yourself some time. So distractions, get up, go for a walk, make sure you have enough breaks because if you don't, you will burn out and you, in theory, you can become demotivated. Right, right. Have you ever gotten like in, to a point where you're gone out? Yes, definitely. I've burnt out at least three times. And the last time I burnt out was in 2020. I wasn't sticking to my schedule. <laughs> Instead <laughs> of spending one hour or two hours, I thought I'm going to do four hours straight of a particular task. Mm -hmm. and I wasn't keeping to my schedule. I was spending too long on specific tasks instead of having a variety in my day. And it got to the point where I felt physically sick. I couldn't turn on the computer anymore. 
Uh, I didn't want to know. I had no more energy. I was tired. I was sick. And that was because I wasn't listen. I wasn't, I wasn't practicing what I was preaching. I should have been sticking to my schedule. So that was the last time I burnt out. So keeping to a schedule, I'm going to say is key. And remember to, to have your breaks because we are human. There's only so much energy we have in a particular day. So right. pace yourself. That's what I'm going to say. Pace yourself. Yeah. I like that. And consciously pace yourself. <laughs> must. Yeah. That's a must. Mm, I would say, what would you say or what advice would you give to your 20 year old self or a 20 year old person who's watching this now and would love to like, I don't know, like really get themselves going and yeah. What advice would you give to your 20 year old self? Right. This, the advice that I would give now is something that I've learned over the past probably five years. And I, I've known this, but I just never really implemented it. Mm -hmm. um, don't be afraid of what other people think. And mm -hmm. I'm also going to say, don't be afraid to cut people out of your life. And I, I'm saying this because my outlook on life is very different from some of the peers I grew up around. Mm -hmm. Quite a few of the people I grew up around, they dare I say they they are people pleasers they want to be like they're not true to themselves and what do I mean by this is what do I mean by this when they are alone or we are alone I start to hear all their problems and their problems are usually down to the choices that they've made because they want to be liked because they want to conform um, I'm not afraid dare I say to offend people now, one thing that I'm not too sure if I mentioned earlier, Mary, was mm -hmm. when I had taught before in Hong Kong, in schools, yeah. I used to make a lot of people cry. And when I came back to the UK, <laughs> as, as an adult, mm -hmm. as a 40-year-old, I was still, I was making people, I was making other adults in the UK cry. And my intention wasn't to make them cry. It's just to ask the question, Why? Why are you doing this? Why are you doing that? So my advice to the young person is be bold, be brave. Don't necessarily give a shit what anyone else thinks or says. Go out, do it, make the mistakes. You must make the mistakes in order to grow. Because at the end of the day, when you succeed, people will see how great you are, how what you've achieved. And they may look and they may look up to you and think, Oh, I aspire to be that person. What people don't see is the blood, the tears, the sweat, the, the heartache. People don't see that. People will only see the fruits of, of your harvest. So go out there, do what you want to do. Don't, don't, listen, don't necessarily listen to what people say. Don't be frightened to, don't be afraid to make mistakes. Be, and let people go if you need to let them go. Now, dare I say, this could even be your own family. If your own family are holding you back and telling you it's pointless, it's silly, don't do this, don't do that, just look to see where they are. Are they happy where they are? Chances are they're not. They want to keep you at their level. And it might sound harsh and horrid, but I've seen so many of this, so much of this. So that's the advice I would give to a 20 year old. Be bold, be brave. Don't be frightened to offend people. Um, and and go after it wow i really really love that it's so authentic and so clear to the point it's like there is this is just the way you know what i mean and i mm -hmm. understand that i get it so perfectly why because i also come from a background where we are so much told or we grow up in an environment where we feel like we are supposed to just fit in or just yes everything that's been said to us it's like 
you don't have any option maybe to ask questions or you just got to fit in. If it's your family, no, you have to because it's your family. Yeah. And it's at the end of the day, you're looking at yourself like, if you're, somebody, if you're really thinking and reflecting on yourself and trying to connect with your inner self, you're asking yourself like, okay, finally, am I living my life or am I living somebody else's life? Yes. And I'm going to say that I don't think enough people ask themselves that question. Am I living my life or am I living someone else's? I don't think many people ask that question at all, because if they did, chances are they might be a lot. They may be brutally honest with themselves and honest with people around them, of which people don't necessarily want to hear. And to add on that, my husband is that category of people who takes ownership. You, you said you are so like you make people cry. He's in that category of people that he just says it. He is so open and so authentic in himself that he's not here to please you. He just don't want you to feel like he just want to be him. Like I'm accepting you for who you are. You just got to accept me for who I am. And I'm going to tell you truths that you might not like, but that is just the truth. It is just what it is. And we have a choice. And the one thing that we often like things like, as if we didn't have any choice, but each and every one of us have been given the ability to make choice. We have the power, you know, we are, there is, we have a choice. There is, it's either you're going this way or you're going that other way. You can't have both at the same time. You can be wanting this and then you're doing something else. And being able to make that distinction and actually taking the path that will bring you, take you to where you feel more fulfilled and you are like, okay, this is really me. It's not easy, you know, being in that environment. I, for, for one, I would say my husband has been that great help for me to get to that point where, you know what, I don't care what the world says. I am being me and I'm making choices that are in alignment with my core values. And I am not afraid to cut people off. Yeah. So, and that's the beauty. You find yourself, you, you, it, it's so relieving. I did ask you that question because for the past weeks that I've seen you, I've known you, I feel like you are that person who is so authentic. You're saying it right. You're not here to please anybody. You're just being Oliver. Yes. And it's hard to find people like that, but those are the type of people that the world needs. We want to empower people. We want the people, people to be themselves. You want to be an inspiration to somebody else to be like, to look at their life and really ask themselves some real questions, being honest with ourselves, because that is where we can get the real truth and being able, because if, you go, if, if I cannot recognize where I'm falling short, how am I going to make a decision to move forward anyway? And that is so needed. Yeah, and I'm going to say some people, they just don't want to hear it. That's it. They prefer to live in a sheltered, protected environment or bubble, which isn't real. And on top of that, they are not happy with themselves. It's always someone else's fault. They won't look in the mirror and think, OK, I will take charge of the situation and I'll rectify what needs to be done. They won't do that. It's easy to point the finger and blame someone else. Um, and co coming back to the UK, so I've been back in the UK now for almost three years. I'm, there, there I say, I've seen a lot of weak individuals, people pleasers, people that are frightened to speak their mind, people that are frightened to say what needs to be said. I've seen a lot of that in the UK, which shocked me when I came back. When, when I was in Asia, people just got up, they worked, they did what they needed to do. There was no thing, there's nothing out there I'm going to say called entitlement. But when I came back to the UK, blimmin' eh, everyone here feels entitled. <laughs> and I said, go out to Asia where you don't have the benefits, where no one's going to help you. Go out to Asia and work your butt off and you will think differently. But then again, 
people want to be, they want, they want the comfort. They want to live in their bubble, um, which I find a bit sometimes <laughs> a bit appeal to chew sometimes when I'm back in the UK. I look around and think, I can't really connect with any of these people here because either they're entitled or they want to pull the wool over their eyes. They don't want to see what's really going on or they just don't want to hear the truth. Mm -hmm. I'm going to say there's, there's a fair amount of that in the UK. Uh, yeah, which, which, which I think is very sad, very sad, to tell the truth. Mm. Wow. Now, you did talk about most, also about communication in sales. Yes. Can you share like some of the tips on how to communicate with, you know, when you're actually going out and or picking up the phone or you meet somebody on the street and you talk, you know, how do you introduce that? How do you get to, you know, them to open up? Because it's not everybody who is ready to open up or maybe say things or, you know, get to that point where they are really sharing some stuff with you. So how do you get to that? Sure. Okay. Um, I'm going to give two different scenarios. Mm -hmm. I'll give the phone and I'll give the cafe. Um, so when it comes to picking up the phone, making a cold call into a potential client, um, it's all to do with, again, the intent isn't to sell. It's right. the introduction. So my name is Oliver. I'm calling from this company. This is what we do. Is now a convenient time to talk? I, I'm not, that, that, that's it. It's very short, sharp, and direct. My name is Oliver. I'm calling from this company. This is what we do. Um, is now a good time to talk. I don't need to say anything else. And I'm going to say with that, you'll need to sound genuine and sincere. So you can't pick up the phone and speak a hundred words per second, expecting someone to say, yeah, good, that's great. Because it's not going to be genuine. It's not going to be sincere. You want to sell me something and I don't believe you want to help me. So it's a no. So when it comes to the call, take your time, know who you're talking to, have your script. And again, you're not selling. All you want is a commitment for a time to speak because you never sell on the first call. Right. Plus, if you're selling a solution that costs thousands of dollars or tens of thousands of dollars, it will never be done on the first call. I've got to understand what you do. You've got to understand more of what I do. Now let's see whether or not there's some synergy to work together. So that's the call. Now, when it comes to the cafe, Say, for example, I'm, I'm in a cafe somewhere or a Starbucks and I'm surrounded by a lot of people wearing suits. And I know that above this Starbucks, there are numerous financial institutes selling information. I could easily strike up, say, for example, a conversation, nothing to do with sales. I'm not interested in what company the person works for or what they do. I'm interested in the person as an individual. What, what do you think of the coffee here? How often do you come? Have you tried anywhere else? This is the type of questions I would ask. And I'm asking these questions sincerely. And most likely I'm dressed appropriately. And I'm just looking at building rapport. That's yeah. all I'm looking at doing. Building rapport. I'm not selling. I don't know what the stranger does. They don't know what I do. We're just talking about the coffee yeah. and yeah, we're just talking about the coffee. And then eventually fingers crossed. Um, well, thank you very much for your time. It was great talking to you. I hope your coffee's good. <laughs> you never know. We might bump into each other again. Right. By the way, my name's Oliver. What's your name? Great, John. Nice to meet you. Now, chances are I might bump into John again. Or chances are John might tell me even who he's working with. And again, I'm not selling. I haven't right. even told John what I'm doing. And there's nothing malicious here at all. These aren't tricks. These are just the ability to express yourself and communicate, dare I say, on a different type of level. It's all about human contact, really. Again, I'm not selling. So <laughs> when it comes to tips and tricks, again, no intent to sell. I'm here to enjoy a coffee 
<laughs> how often do you come here? Is, is the coffee great? I'm only here because I've got a meeting. Um, so those are two types of scenarios. With the phone, it's commitment for time to talk. Face to face, it's, hi, how are you doing? What's, what's your name? Is the coffee here great? And I can go into detail, but that might be a bit too long. Um, you've shared, yeah. you've shared pretty lot. So yeah, you feel very open. You've shared, you've shared lots of, of tips. That's really like, wow. Mm. And there is one thing I also wanted to bring up is you do have, you've created, um, you have your company. Yes. Right. So you've created some free products. So I want you to talk about it so people can actually visit your website and see how they can check that out. And sure. Yeah. So I've got a few products on my site at the moment. And one of them was a paid low cost product. But I'm actually going to be offering that for free very shortly. And it's six modules on how to get pe on how to pick up the phone get through to the decision makers tell your pitch and get people buying into you the individual um, and that's going to be on my website for free very shortly and there are six modules each module covers a different step within the sales process and they're very straightforward to to follow very easy some of them is very surprising and I'm going to say when it comes to sales and cold calling in particular, before the face-to-face, -face, a lot of it is to do with confidence and the reason as to why should people be listening to you. Um, so that's on my website. My website address is www.readconsultancy.com. That's read, R-E-A-D-E. -E. It's in read a book with an E at the end, readconsultancy.com. Beautiful. And thank you so much. Uh... Oliver, for sharing from your heart. It's been a great time with you. And on the description box of this episode, I'm going to have your information, your website uh, on there so they can get to you directly and get maybe a free product or just look at what you're offering and what you are, uh, what they can learn from you or maybe get in contact with you. Yeah. Perfect. So this will definitely have that. Uh, I appreciate you really being here with us today. The sharing was good. I enjoyed it. And I would, uh, do you have anyone, any other word or something you want to share with us before we actually call it quick? I'd say be tenacious. Don't give up because, because it's never over until you say it's over. Beautiful. I love that. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. So, ladies, one. thanks. Ladies and gentlemen, we'll come to the end of this episode, which is going to be out there very soon. Make sure you take time, make sure you actually you heard everything Oliver said. Take action, be committed to your goals and dreams, and make sure you visit uh, the website. If you have any questions or anything to ask Oliver, do not hesitate, he's very open and he will provide you with a solution or to serve you and to guide you on what is it that you would love. So uh, take, as for now, keep taking care of yourself, keep being creative, and uh, I'll see you on the next episode.